Thank you for joining me in this panel. Uh, we have Lisa uh, here from um, uh, Lisa Mastio, I would say, uh, from U the youth, the international youth think tank. Sana, as we just heard. We also have Paul Omer and also Kevin Kas Kasas. Thank you so much for joining me remotely as well. And um, since we are joined by Nobel Prize laureate, Paul, would you like to um, just uh, say what your thoughts were hearing these two talks? Um, I had two thoughts. Uh, first, uh, I think it's helpful when we understand human behavior and social interaction to draw a distinction between thinking and feeling. What are our thoughts? What are our feelings? A lot of our attention tends to get focused on thoughts, conscious interaction, transmission of information. I think we, and we meaning especially economists, have underestimated the importance of feelings. So I'll try and describe why that's relevant here. And then also I want to emphasize that at the end of the day, it's the evidence that will matter, not what we conjecture, not what our theories are. The participation could op 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 operate through two mechanisms. One is people are better informed, they have information, um, they feel consciously that they have a sense of, uh, of influence or access. Um, but participation could also operate through this level of feelings where people increase their sense of responsibility, their sense of civic duty, the, these kind of vague, somewhat old fashioned notions about doing what's what's right. And I suspect that this is really the, the central element in democracy. Unfortunately, it turns out that if you just operate based on pure thought, it never makes sense to vote. In any election with reasonable numbers of people, the odds that your vote will change things are so low that the thinking channel basically encourages the kind of disengagement that we've, we've just heard about. But if we can increase these other dimensions, you do it because it's right. You do it because it may help other people see that it's right and participate as well. Then I think we have a better grasp on what could work and what's required to make democracy work. Um, the other thing I'll say is my, my father was a politician who worked at many scales. He was a governor of the state of Colorado. He worked as head as the Democratic National Committee under um, Bill Clinton. Then he was actually uh, the school superintendent in Los Angeles. The thinking channel um, leads to theories where we predict that democracy will work best in those local, more focused settings like the elected school board <laughs> to which he was accountable. Uh, the reality was that the elected school board, uh, he says, was the most dysfunctional representation of democracy he's ever seen. So uh, I'll just I'll just end with that. If there's questions, I could uh, elaborate. But at the end of the day, we still have to always look at the evidence and see what actually makes democracy function better. Thanks. Lisa, I first turn to you here, because you, obviously, with the youth, International Youth Think Tank, I mean, how do you actually get young people involved in, like, city planning, and why is it important? Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Paul, for your uh, statements to this. I think it's really crucial that democracy is also based on trust, because we're a community and citizens have a say. I mean, you were talking about people saying, oh, my vote is not that valuable. Yesterday, we spoke with people at the Open Chair Democracy Talks, and so many people said, yes, I have power because I'm allowed to vote, but I wish that I would have more power. So we need to empower our citizens to strengthen our democracies. I think that's a very important part, and there are a lot of different methods we could use to make our democracy stronger. Mm. So, so, Kevin, I mean, you are the Secretary General of IDEA. What is your experience from Latin America? where you've been based. Look, I mean, thank you for having me, first of all. And, and, and let me, before I go to Latin America, let me react a little bit to, to the presentations. Let me just say that by all accounts, democracy is facing huge challenges uh, globally, and particularly during the pandemic. I mean, the, the, what we're seeing amounts to a huge crisis for democracy in, in many ways. So I'm all in favor of using this moment to be bold, 
to reform democracy, to renew democracy, to introduce new forms of deliberation and participation. And citizens' assemblies are one of, of many that are emerging in different places in the world. And I guess the, the presentations uh, speak to the fact that cities can be laboratories for new uh, innovative forms of participation and, and deliberation that can be tried out more easily at the local setting. So I, I think that's you know one thing that uh, uh, would ameliorate the huge crisis that traditional representative institutions are, are facing. I mean, are they, representative institutions in the traditional sense are even shambles everywhere. I mean, you just have to see surveys across the world asking people what they, what they think, what their opinion is about Congresses or about, a, or about political parties. I mean, I'll give you a factoid. You know, you take the, the World Values Survey, which covers a 79, 80 countries, and when people are asked the level, what, what level of confidence, of trust they have in political parties, only 4% of the population globally uh, professes to have a high level of trust in political parties. I mean, that tells you all you need to know about the need to introduce new ways of deliberating and participating. Now, let me say something, something additional. Daniel gave a very good list of reasons why citizens' assembly might be a good innovation for democracy. And, you know, he told about uh, allowing people to engage better with, with, uh, with the political process, that they ensure diversity in the policymaking process. But there's a crucial, there's a crucial benefit that, that he didn't mention, which is the citizens' assemblies are less likely to be captured by organized interests. And, and that's become a huge distortion in democratic processes uh, all over the world. Interesting, very interesting. I mean, Sana, what do you think about that? I uh, know I, I very much agree. I mean, um, at the Digital Lab, we've not only worked with a lot of local governments in Sweden, we've also worked with uh, the city of New York, the city of Chicago, the European Commission, uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, the city of Madrid, Barcelona. So it's not something that a problem that only exists in Sweden. I mean, Sweden is a very interesting country since we have this history of trust in governments, uh, the strong welfare states and et cetera, but we still see the same problems where speci specifically marginalized groups, people that historically have been uh, repressed or has experienced discrimination are less likely to vote and they are less likely to show up to a dialogue meeting. And it's exactly the same in New York and in Madrid. I mean, it's the same type of structures. And we also see that, that people organize in new ways today uh, similar to that we have technology, new types of technology today. I mean, people are adapting uh, every day in new ways and democracy has to as well. Like we were talking about, like Kevin was talking about, which we have to be more experimental. We have to try new things. We can't be so conservative when it comes to uh, local politics and decision making. It has to kind of match the way that citizens organize and see their city. Mm -hmm. And when we base decisions on actual needs of the people who live in areas, that's expertise, you know, that's local expertise. Someone that's lived for 30 years in an area knows exactly the road that's the most, you know, horrible road in, in their area or the problems that they see and face every day. And that's why we need to work more collectively with citizens. But how can we create that trust in the cities if people don't actually believe or trust the political parties? What would you say, Paul? Um, well, I, I think trust is a very good example of something which could be based on just pure rational thought. If I do this, then he'll think that and then she'll do this. But trust ultimately has to be grounded in certain feelings about commonality, that we're in this together. We're part of a, you know, there's a shared interest that we have. So a way to evaluate the, the success of some of these measures is do they actually build trust? Now, well, let me just suggest a, a different example of participation so that we can broaden the discussion. Uh, something I've done and I would recommend for everyone is do a, a ride along with the police in the city that you live in. Just spend a shift riding in a police car 
and just find out what it's like to do the job of the police. It, it would be equally interesting, I think, to see what's it like to do the job of picking up the trash or of teaching. But because police is such a policing is such a fraught issue, it would, I think, be good to, for more people to just have a little bit of understanding of the human side of what it's like to do this job. And I, I wish we would think as societies a little bit more about maybe we should bring back some notion of mandatory public service for young people, but where instead of serving in the army, perhaps they spent their time um, interacting with the people who teach, the people who pick up the trash, the people who do the, the policing. And that from that, we might build uh, this sense of trust, this sense that we're all in it together, and this, this, this uh, reminder that we're all human and there are things that we can share and work together towards. Sana, you would love to, like to uh, comment yeah. on that. I mean, the issue of trust is something that always comes up when you work with participatory democracy. And obviously, the, what we see as the main you know, solution to increasing trust is power. Like, equal access to power is trust. When we see citizens or governments continuously doing citizen dialogues where they promise things to citizens and don't deliver, where actually, especially young people, they show up to these city dialogues and they speak about their experiences and they actually have local solutions and then nothing happens and there's no transparency in the process, then citizens won't learn about democracy. They, you, you only learn by doing, right? You, you learn about having uh, tr trust and having a responsibility by actually being given that. And that's a problem you see today. Um, and I think it's important what you're saying, Paul, but I would also like to see the reverse. Like, I would like to see police officers actually going into local communities and spending time with them, marginalized sure. communities. Like, I think we have to learn from all experiences. And that's what I love about citizen assemblies, that it's based on demographic hmm. so tradition, that we know that we have a representation from the beginning of lived, different lived experiences. So, so if I can yeah. say, I, I think part of, part of our shared uh, our agreement here is, is that we ultimately have to look at the evidence and see, are these mechanisms having the effects that we want? Can I interject there? Um, no, this is, this is very interesting. I, I think, you know, it's, it would be great to have uh, citizens assemblies, but more generally, it, with or without citizens' assemblies, I think the local dimension of politics is a, is a dimension that is more uh, solution-oriented. It's less affected, and I'm painting here with a broad brush, I know, there might be exceptions of dysfunctional local governments and, you know, but generally speaking, it's less affected by grand ideologies. And as a result, it has the potential uh, to the extent that the local dimension of government grows in power. It has the potential to ameliorate one of the existential crises that democracy, liberal democracy is facing, which is polarization. It, it, they tend to be less polarized, local governments. I mean, it, and ultimately there's no left wing or right wing way to repair the potholes or to collect the garbage. Uh, so, you know, to the extent that they help to ameliorate polarization and to the extent that they help to mitigate the sense of disaffection, the notion that people are not in control, which is another existential threat to liberal democracy, uh, I think they can, they can provide a huge service for democracy. Generally speaking, and I, we don't have time to go into that, generally speaking, cities are good for democracy for many reasons. I mean, including uh, because urbanization is good for education and education is good for democracy. And uh, the, the evidence, it tends to suggest very strongly, certainly the evidence from, from Latin America that people in urban areas have greater support for democracy, more interest in, in political affairs, more interpersonal trust, harsher attitudes towards corruption, all those things are functional to robust uh, democracies. So Lisa, just as a like, final note here, are there any innovations that we can actually 
to strengthen those kind of democracies in cities that you think? Yeah, I mean, what Daniel just presented and what we always got back to the community assemblies are an innovation in themselves and they can make innovation through the proposals, the outcome that will be in an already legislative language and can directly be implemented. And like with these processes and all the other processes we just mentioned during this discussion, they are innovation and they can be a really, really valuable addition to our institutions. I think that could be a good way of framing the innovation of strengthening thank, democracy. Thank you very much. Susanna Gottbili, Samastio, Paul Roma and Kevin Castles for joining me today. Thank you.